I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. And like every other Iraqi, I am one of the children of the world's first civilizations, of those who pioneered the wheel, writing, algebra, and countless other inventions. You could say that finding solutions to problems is in our blood. But we are also unfortunately the children of countless wars from ancient civilizations to recent invasions, a constant cycle of turmoil. I was born in 1995 during the latter, the era of the post-Gulf War embargo, where Iraq experienced incredible hardships and survived through knowledge, innovation, adaptation, and unparalleled resolve. But let us begin before 1990. Imagine a beautiful, historic city with cafes serving as hubs for intellectuals and poets. Literacy rates in Iraq were higher than some US states, and we'll come back to the value of education later. Foreign reserves were in the dozens of billions of dollars at that time, and we did not have a single cent of debt. But then one day, in 1990, Iraq, under the rule of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship, invaded neighboring Kuwait with the aim of overthrowing the Kuwaiti government and annexing the state. In four days, Security Council passed Resolution 661, placing Iraq under economic sanctions. Now, the first part of that was a ban on all imports of dual-use nature. So anything that could be repurposed for an act of war or a weapon was not allowed in the country. The second component was a ban on all oil exports. This was particularly bad because at the time, 80% of Iraq's exports were composed of oil. In one year, the Iraqi GDP was down by 65%. The average Iraqi went from earning $4,000 in a year to just $1,400. Practically overnight, the country was thrown into chaos. But the impact was not just financial, it was also emotional. It's easy to forget that war is simply terrifying. This is a picture of the so-called highway of death, the road that Iraqi forces used when they were forced to hastily retreat from Kuwait. My father was stationed in Kuwait at the time. He was a medical officer helping treating the wounded. When Iraq retreated, he was fortunate to be on a bus transport. Many weren't. He recalls escaping during the night under the cover of airstrikes. And he and his team of doctors on the bus could see Iraqi soldiers dying by the side of the road. Some were running for their lives, others incapacitated. And the thing is that they had the resources and training on that bus to help these falling soldiers. But they couldn't stop for a second, lest they become the next victim for the American aircraft above. The guilt and horrors they have endured that night and throughout the war as a whole will be with them for the rest of their lives. And the thing is, this story is a staple component of every Iraqi family. But life had to go on. Let's examine the secret to the continuation of our way of life. Iraqis vehemently opposed the war, but they had to survive the present situation. And so they united under the slogan, Tabban lil mustahil. Screw the impossible. I would like to share just three examples, that of food, capital, and medicine, that highlight the multiple facets of Iraqi life in the post-war era of embargo, a tale of survival that I am very proud of. Now, food supplies were immediately hit. Iraq was traditionally self-sufficient, but years of neglect during the preceding Saddam rule and the preceding Iranian war meant that we were relying more and more on imports. 
However, 12% of Iraq is arable, and that's why the Neolithic Revolution happened there in the very first place, thousands of years ago. We also had a highly trained agricultural workforce, and the combination of the two meant that Iraq was restored to self-sufficiency. Well, mostly. Who likes bananas? That's good. <laughs> some things that naturally grow in Iraq. And during some periods of the embargo, we actually had the black market where bananas were traded, because you couldn't get them in any other way. Other foods, such as sugar, were heavily rationed, and anything that used it was controlled or banned. But life had to go on, and so Iraqis just learned how to make alternatives at home. And if you meet any or era Iraqi today, chances are they will know how to make soft drinks, desserts, baklava, bread, and all sorts of other things from scratch. And the point here is that if we did not have the natural resources and the highly trained workforce, Iraq would have crumbled in months, if not weeks. The second example is that of spare parts. So particularly mechanical objects were often considered to be dual use. They could be used to repair a tank, for example, and were not allowed to be imported. That and a combination of other factors meant that there was a huge shortage of spare parts. And Iraqis very much adopted the mentality of need is the mother of innovation. If you had two cars that didn't work, you took parts from each one, and you went out with one working vehicle. Nothing was irreparable. My uncle was in the army at the time. He reverse engineered French radar systems to repair them, maintain their operation, and even improve their performance, because we lost the support of the French during the embargo. Today, he can literally fix anything. <laughs> and the interesting part is that we lost a large amount of the expatriate population immediately during the war or the ensuing embargo. Iraq is often said to be a land of engineers, and the truth is, because we had this native, skilled workforce, we managed to survive. The final example is that of medicine. So medical equipment was aging for many of the same reasons, and imports of medical supplies was restricted. I personally missed most of my vaccinations until I left Iraq for the first time. And let me give you the example of anesthesia. So Iraq's stocks was dwindling, and doctors often had to resort to using expired or veterinary anesthesia. Now, this stuff is quite volatile, and it was very difficult to get the right dose. And so we ended up with people that had side effects, some had hallucinations, some simply had too much but we administered the operations anyways. My father was a surgeon at the time. He and thousands of other doctors worked very hard to modify their training, adapt their procedures to work with available resources in order to provide this country with the medical care it needed against all odds. Now, these were just three examples. The stories of food, capital, and medicine were replicated in every aspect of Iraqi society. An incredible story of perseverance that was repeated not only during that conflict, but for conflicts throughout the last century and beyond. And it has had a tangible impact on the very fiber of our institution. So what are the lasting impacts that this has left on Iraqis even today? There are two important downsides and an upside. The first downside is that of opportunity cost. So the embargo effectively halted development in the entire country. While others around us were advancing, we had to consume all of our energy just to maintain our way of life. We effectively lost 15 years of more of development. And then there's the second downside, which is this idea of short-termism. Now, war by its nature is very unpredictable. But Iraq has experienced some form of instability for the last thousand years since the Mughals wrecked the flourishing 
Abbasid capital of Baghdad, all the way back then. And I find that today, Iraqis struggle with planning for anything that is not in the immediate future. Even those that have fled are in safe havens around the world with nothing to worry about. And if you think about it, how can you plan to buy a house in five years' time when you simply don't know if there will be another airstrike in two weeks that will destroy the one that you live in today? I personally also believe that this is one of the key drivers behind the poignant culture of corruption that is plaguing our country today. It is so much easier for officials to focus on their short-term gains as opposed to the long-term prosperity of the country. But with the downsides come an upside, and that is that Iraqis today are desensitized in a good way, they're very durable, and they are not phased by anything. I personally escaped most of the hardship, but I still experience this in my personality. I have this memory at a very young age where my mom hid me behind a curtain to show me low-passing fighter jets during an airstrike. And this sounds terrifying, but the reality was is that it was normal to any contemporary Iraqi childhood. And for all Iraqis, whether it's a natural disaster, a financial crisis, a trade embargo, or yet another war, they have seen it all before. There is nothing new. They put their heads down and they do what they have to in order to survive. While preparing this talk, I received a lot of feedback that I was delivering it in a tone that was very relaxed in context and perhaps emotionless in context of everything that I was talking about. And this was a huge point of self-reflection for me because I realized that I also had a lot of impact on myself from this phenomenon. This has all become very normal and part of a reality to me. And so we've talked about the story of survival of Iraq and the embargo. We talked about some of the downsides of opportunity cost and short-termism, and we also talked about the upside of sheer durability. What are the key takeaways for me? I've been incredibly fortunate to have been born in Iraq and grown up in my beautiful country, but I left before the latest string of violence. And so I do not hold any resentment towards my country damaging my future anyway or not giving me access to opportunities. I was actually very fortunate to live and learn abroad and in the West. So in a sense, I have the connection to home I have no negative feelings towards it, and I also have many of the right tools that are required to support my country. And so I know that no matter what path my career takes me in the future, it has to end with Iraq. And I also know that me and others like me have a responsibility because of our position to inspire others around the world from the Iraqi diaspora to go back and take an active part in rebuilding this beautiful country that is the cradle of civilization. Thank you.